Grant Dania now. It's Grant Dania. The gold logie this year. Oh my god, it's Grant Dania. And our mom, Shazzy Dania. She's really crazy. It's all true. It's all true. The podcast with Grant and Shazzy Dania. You know what I just realised? The fact that we're now on YouTube is I have to realise that you can see our faces. Yeah, so Grant pulling like horrible faces at me when I'm trying to mouth to him that he's got to look at the camera. Like, and I realised like, that... Look at the camera. He's like, what? I realise I look away a lot too when I listen to your <laughs> stories. And it's not that I'm not interested. It's oh, just I, I like to reflect is. on them. Um, but yeah, it. I realised that I gave you a dirty look then. Because you did you, give me a dirty look. Because you're the worst mouth mouther. <laughs> Like you literally, you do this when you're whispering and, and you have to like mouth something like, hey, look at the camera. Like your mouth does a completely different shape to words. Like it doesn't even look, look what you're saying. I don't even know how to explain it, but it's goddamn annoying. I was like, look at the camera. All right. All right. All right. Anyway, Hi, welcome. Hi, George. We're here. <laughs> hey, guys. It's really hard because we've done, what, three seasons of like no YouTube and just us kind of just in our own zone, knowing that nobody is actually watching us yeah. right now. But now we've got yeah. nearly the whole world critiquing every <laughs> single moment. Mm. Like, I, I was doing my own little dance and the whole lot. It's, it's going to come back and bite us one day. You were rocking out. And you know what? You were bringing instant vibe. You were the vibe master. And there's yeah, nothing the wrong master. with that, my friend. I have been called the vibe master in many settings. So thank you very was much. The vibe master also one of the things that fell out of your pinata that you were telling us about <laughs> last week? <laughs> The Vibe Master 3000, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Haven't tested it out yet. On but six I do have a story. Usually you ask about the dating thing and I don't really have any stories about my dating life because, let's face it, I don't go around dating too often. But yeah. today I, uh, I, was, I was doing a broadcast at a, at a careers expo and I ended up uh, interviewing two third-year uh, dental students and wow. uh, on air I was asking them, hey, can you rate my smile? I'll rate yours. I think you've got a really pretty smile, oh, whatever. Oh, so what stuff. happens? One thing leads to another and Big Sarge has got a number. Hey! Hey! <laughs> Good work, Big Doggy. And a potential filling practice. Yes, <laughs> I've got a free clean coming up. I'm not even kidding. A free clean of my teeth. Mate, that's their well, that keepers, dead dentists. sexy. That's, yeah. you know, they'll be rich. Great <laughs> right first date, beautiful like teeth. looking right at my teeth. That's going to be a horrible start. Yeah. Did they have nice teeth? I always beautiful. wonder. Yeah, I always wonder if if dentists uh, like floss and well, brush well, extra they, well. They, they're, remember, they're a billboard for their own work. Like, if you had missing teeth and they were green, would you go to that dentist? No. No, but they genuinely believe that you have to floss. I mean, how many people will actually floss all the time? I know you don't. So I'm not I never floss. Yeah. I do. Well, are George, you... you better start before this day. He's the pickers. <laughs> I'm now. Are you, uh, did you ask for the number or did she provide the number? How did it go down exactly? Well, it was just sort of on air flirting in a way. Like I've never had it happen before. And then afterwards we just sort of got speaking about the clinic and where I can go and get a, uh, a clean and get my teeth checked up because it's been quite some time. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, she said, oh, I can give you the number. And I said, oh, great. Can I have your number too? Yes. Oh. She went, like, the reception's like, no, just your number, like, direct to the... <laughs> Are you, on air? Are you on air when you're doing this? No, no, this is directly after. Okay, right. So the interview's the finished. Oh, this is great. Yeah. And she was and, like. And that's it. I got the number. Oh, that's magic. Have you texted Should her Should we call already? her right now? <laughs> <laughs> I bet you we did. No. She might be doing a filling right now, but yeah, uh, I'll text not. her later and, and see. But, yeah, I mean, look, we'll see how we go. This could be quite the journey uh, for this season to see how it Georgie boy goes with the dentist. Fabulous. Well, if you come in next week and you've got like a full, what is it? A rail or like a grill. A grill. A grill. A full grill. <laughs> a full f- fake smile will know that she's completely sold on you. She's hooked me up, yeah. But sometimes mm. dating is like pulling teeth, so you started at the right point, I guess. Can you stop <laughs> fiddling with your microphone? I'm playing with my microphone. People can't hear it. It's it's comforting yeah, for my nerves. It's an, why are you it's really nervous? playing with the microphone. You see a lot of podcasters and radio announcers like throwing the bad boy all over the place. So yeah. we're just in pros, uh, essentially, Shares. Yeah, but the sound drops out. What about on, um, yeah, on Nova? Like if you see Tim Blackwell, 
you know, Australia's number one drive time radio show, he swings that thing around like he's uh, uh, Robbie Williams. He takes it out of the shock mount and swings it by the cord sometimes. The guy's a lunatic. Unbelievable. All right. Well, well we want to. Um, we we want our dating updates. As, yeah, we uh, do. Have you have you picked a date? Are we going on a date? Has that been mentioned yet? Oh, uh, no, no, no dates. But I think there's definitely like a clean of the teeth kicking off very, very soon. So that might be the first date, oh, which might be very awkward. Yeah, she's going to clean my teeth oh, at the surgery. I've... But I want—I don't want that to be the first time, you know. Yeah, I don't know, mate. I think the power dynamic will be wrong. You know, she'll have all the upper hand, and you'll just be a victim in her chair. You know what I mean? Like, sure. I'm not sure. She went... What if you're an excessive off... bleeder or something Ugh. from the gums and? You know, and you could faint. be a horrible experience. <laughs> you need to, <laughs> and you're faint. You need to start using the picksters or start, um, yeah, flossing. You just concentrate on what you're doing over there and stop telling me what to do with my microphone. I know. Because it's, it's breaking your own concentration. No, do you know what's breaking my own com- concentration? How's that for you? Huh? Uh, Grant gave you me like his cold. He was breathing <clears throat> hot air all over me. Mm, he's given me his cold. So. The whole world's got a cold, so who cares? Let's yeah. move on. Right. So we've got some really cool reviews. Oh, when you need sympathy, it's like, oh, I'm dying. Mate. <laughs> no one's ever been as sick as this. You have and become the least most sympathetic person. Sympathetic. In, in the sympathetic <laughs> in the, to, to my ability to speak <laughs> and also my ability to be well. Mate, when I got COVID, you were an angry <laughs> Uncaring. <laughs> that was last season. I was dying. Oh, here we go. Quick. Somebody play a violin music. No. I was lying in bed, um, throwing up blood. Um, oh, whatever. As my hand went up against the glass window <laughs> to say my last goodbyes to my children <laughs> as it slid down the, down the glass. I love you, kids. <laughs> as I took my last breath, Shezzy went, Oh, that'll be right. <laughs> Leave us here by <laughs> ourselves. Yeah. We've, While you lie in bed. We've already covered this off in last season. Well, we I was crook at the there. weekend and I didn't get much sympathy from you then either. So don't expect it from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crickets is exactly what I got when I They still don't sound like crickets. They sound like seagulls. All right. So we've got a couple of reviews here. Hey, let's just remind everyone. Quickly. Uh, we do have some reviews here. But also, don't forget, you can send us in a little audio message. Yes. So whether it's like a, a voice note from your from the from the voice app on your phone, yeah, you can send it straight to George uh, and his Instagram account. So hit him up, uh, send it through to his DMs. What's your uh, what's your handle, mate? That's it. At underscore G Sarge, do a shout out, do a review. We'd love to hear the voices behind the words. Yeah. yeah. What do you got, Shaz? So from Edith Morris, how many dicks does George need to do horse lips on for the season not to be over yet? <laughs> 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 Who wrote that one? That was <laughs> that was uh, that was hidden away, but that was from last season. So that was um, Edith Morris. How good is that? Edith. I love that. Edith's coming Did the in. Hot. Entertainment Network actually hide that comment specifically because of the, the content within it. <laughs> I don't think they know what they've got in. Oh, that's good. <laughs> They're in for. Um, Alison and Denny Harris. Oh, my God, I've just heard the last episode of It's All True Season 3. Please hurry back soon. So these are just a few from last season that I kind of missed. Um, And Rebecca Nichols. Uh, I've been listening to your podcast daily for the past two weeks. I haven't been able to work out how to leave a review on Spotify, um, but I have worked out how to give you five stars. We've had a few people say that. So hopefully with this new send us in, you know, a voice memo, we'll be able to override that. Um, Please tell Grant never to talk about pimple popping again. I nearly spewed in my car and had to fast forward that bit. When did we talk about pimple popping? Oh, like many seasons ago. And I do remember saying to you, stop talking about it, that show. It I, is so revolting. I had a good urge the other day that I just wanted just going to start looking up some some pimple popping on YouTube, like big cysts too, not just pimples. Oh my god! Big, she just asked you not to talk about it. Right, review. <laughs> oh, oh, I got one here. Don't do it. <clears throat> oh, this one starts with complaint. Um, mm. Is that by email or? I felt the need to write to express how disgusted I am with your recent podcast and song, "Horse Lips on a Penis." Oh. Okay. I've been waiting for this. Is this legit? Yeah. 
I think the whole thing is vulgar, immature and terrible entertainment. <laughs> Horses are much more than the butt of jokes. They are majestic animals who need to be who, who need to be treated with the greatest of respect. Um What does it say? Oh, I found your jokes about vocal warm-ups and horse lips on a penis to be degrading and embarrassing. Oh, my God. Who's it signed from? Oh, that's from Farlap. Okay, gotcha. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Farlap. (laughs) Screw you. We've had a lot of fun with it. (laughs) Oh, but Farlap hasn't finished. Farlap's got a joke. P.S. Here's a joke. What do you call an Amish guy with a hand in a horse's mouth? A mechanic. Good one. Yeah, good one. Far lap. Oh. oh, that happened far too quick. I didn't process that at all. Mate, George, you were, you you were absolutely face. crapping yourself you then. You were crapping yourself. I went so white. Far out. You yeah. thought you'd literally just annoyed the entire country. Just off that one comment. I would have based everything, all the positive stuff off that one comment. Isn't That's that funny how, how we do that. That is what we do. That is psychology good segue into what i wanted to talk about today is it though psychology no (laughs) um what are we doing so i was shopping with the girls and uh with our kids and we're in a um in a big kind of superstore in sydney and we were looking at toys and there was a um, book stand next to the toy section and when i was kind of walking past a book just fell off. There was like, no no one around. There's no one around. I know it sounds really strange, um, but so it it's like fully just legit. It jumped off the shelf yeah. by itself. Yeah, I've got sore cheeks because I'm thinking about how crazy this sounds. Um, anyway, it fell off, so I picked it up, and it was um, it was this book, Embracing Change, uh, which I just you know had a quick look at, and I thought hmm, this is quite interesting. This feels like a sign from the universe. That's what I, yeah, mm. that's exactly what I thought. Yeah. So I had a quick look through just while I was standing in the shop and um, and the first section that I opened up was on grief and I thought, hey, this is pretty applicable you know, mm. to me uh, lost, at the moment. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I reached out to the author of this book Yana Firestone, who's a therapist, and I just asked her if she could come on the podcast today and and have a bit of a chat with us um, about her book. She also hosts a podcast, um, the Curious Life podcast. So we'll, let's get her on the phone. Yeah. What, what are other some of the other topics she also discusses? Well, is it just grief, or no, is it lots of different other things? Lots of other topics. Yeah, she goes into imposter syndrome. Oh, okay, guilty. Yeah. <laughs> So I wanted to ask her a little bit about that. She also talks about anxiety. Um, it's pretty interesting, yeah, but I'll... Sounds like something for everyone here. Get, get Yana on the dog and bone. I want to know if Yana Firestone is her real name. It's a good name. It's a really good name. I'm going to turn up the volume there, Grant. Am I bossy? No. <laughs> I'm I'll pinching him under the desk. <laughs> Hi there. Hi, Yana. It's Grant, Shezzy and George. How are you going? I'm very well, thanks. How are you going? Yeah, good, thank you. Look, we are recording. We have to tell you that. Um, are you right if we have a chat with you about your book that's been jumping off the uh, book stands <laughs> onto my feet? Absolutely. I think the universe wanted us to have this chat. Isn't that so bizarre? It's- I know. It's uh, it's obviously meant to be. So, w- look, when I picked up your book, the first thing that struck me was embracing change because mm-hmm. I guess that's kind of been a topic that we've been discussing a little bit over the, the past season, just, you know, a few things have changed in our lives and um, so it's quite applicable to us. But the first mm. chapter that really stood out for me was about grief. Um mm-hmm. I lost a friend earlier this year and it's she was a really good friend and it's been quite difficult. Um, so, yeah. Um, what, what made you want to write, write the book before we get into grief specifically? What, what was your, your hopes and dreams? Well, uh, I actually came about it in a bit of a, an unorthodox way and I was very lucky that the publishers actually came to me 
um, and they found me through my podcast and thought I had a book in me. And funnily enough, I'd always imagined writing something, but I had these fantasies of writing, you know, a great work of fiction or something like that with no <laughs> manuscripts or anything. <laughs> but, you know, I had that romantic idea of sitting in a beautiful apartment in Paris or something <laughs> like that, writing to my heart's content. Um, but in fact, you know, I started thinking about what are the things I actually know about and what might be helpful for me to share. And it was, you know, right in the middle of the pandemic when we'd all been working from home and having our lives completely twisted upside down and having to pivot and adapt at a rate of, you know, 100 miles an hour. And it just sort of got me thinking about, well, what are the things that we can do or what are the things that prevent us from taking those leaps and making those transitions easily? Because every single one of us has something. We all have a story. We all have challenges to overcome. So I just started thinking it might be helpful to unpack some of those barriers to change, uh, given that we are continuing to be forced to change and adapt as, you know, this new world that we're living in continues to, you know, bulldoze its way forward. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to share some of my own personal experiences and my experience as a therapist um, with readers and you know I've had the privilege of hearing some really important stories from really well-known people in Australia and I thought you know it's so important to hear these messages you know when we look at people that are doing or seemingly doing really well and appear to have it all together on Instagram and they look like they've got these sparkly shiny lives and when they break it down and say, well, actually, I'm not okay and I haven't been okay for various different reasons, I think it makes us all feel a little bit more like we're okay too. Mm. Yeah, I I completely agree with you. And I understand that, you know, for my professional career, I know that it's been my job to, to put your face on and, and get out there and put a nice shiny suit on and smile and make gags and give away, you know, cash and cars and game shows. And you yeah. can you can be that guy. You can be that turned up to 11, um, but you can't be that all mm-hmm. the time. And it's yeah, yeah. it's funny. Everyone expects you to, to be that person full time when it's just not humanly possible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, what pressure to be living under, you know, to, to live up to the expectations of, you know, the unseen eye and the other side of the camera. I mean, it's it, like you say, it's not possible to live like that. Nobody can be quote unquote happy all the time either. You know, there's that whole happiness myth that we're all supposed to be striving to be happy all the time, but it's not possible. You know, we'd be lunatics if we were all just <laughs> permanently happy. You know, you've got to have the highs and the lows and, and that's what real life is about. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. And it's not that, I, that, I'm, that I'm saying, that, wow, woe is me, how hard is my life? I know I have a really wonderful life and I'm very lucky to have the career that I've been given. I'm, act- you know, I'm exceptionally blessed. It, it, yeah. It's just that this podcast came along and we thought, well, why can't we talk about the things that suck? Why can't we talk about the moments when we hurt or we've failed yeah. or we've embarrassed ourselves or we've hit rock bottom? And I think I've never been able and didn't have the language to talk about how to climb out of those holes until we started really doing this podcast. And it's, and it's kind of nice because people come up to you and they chat to you on a completely different level. Instead of asking you about, you know, your professional work, they relate to you as a human being or they have a similar story about when they were struggling. And it's kind of, it's really, I thought I had to pretend my whole life. And now I realize that you actually, you don't. And that's a really lovely realization. Absolutely. And I think that's a, that's a, a modern luxury now. You know, I think for a long time, you know, you were, you sort of had to put on that facade and you didn't really have any avenue to um, talk about all the hard stuff and connect with people on that level. And now with social media and, and podcasting and things like that, you can connect with people on a much deeper level. And I think we're all talking about mental health now in a much more normalized way. You know, we kind of accept that it's, it's part of the package of, of that human experience that we're going to have 
you know, high highs and low lows and, you know, sharing those stories uh, is what I think is the most important part of being human and, and, you know, making us all feel like, okay, well, it's hard for everyone and how's that person managing that part of it and how's that person managing? Okay, well, maybe I'm, you know, managing it pretty well myself yeah. um, or not at all and I need to do something about it, you know. I definitely think that people are craving authenticity um, mm. at the moment. Which and, you don't get a lot yeah. of on Instagram because um, it's the totally. antithesis yeah. of, yeah, of is... authenticity. There's faked authenticity <laughs> on there, but everyone's propping up their best life on there. Um, totally, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. We're all guilty of that, aren't we? I mean, you want to put your, your kind of best photo and the, the highlight of the day up there. Um, but I think, you know, having a, a – at least having moments where you're authentic, as you say, Shazzy, with your feelings and your experiences doesn't mean you have to always be talking about the hard stuff. But if you're kind of giving the whole picture, it means you can take the Instagram shiny stuff and know that there's all that other stuff going on too. And I think that's the stuff that makes other people feel like they're not alone. Mm. You're, did you say you're a therapist? Is, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So you I'd imagine you're a fairly, you know, factual like sciencey kind of person. You're uh, intelligent, you're you you're well studied, no doubt. Do you believe <laughs> in the idea that a book can just jump off the shelf in front of someone and that be a sign from the universe? Do you do you buy into that sort of stuff? Do you know what, Grant? I totally buy into that stuff. I yes, I've got two degrees, and you know, there's a part of my brain that is rational and believes in facts and evidence. Um, but there's another part of me that thinks there's this whole world out there that's unexplained, and I've had so many things like that happen that can't be just coincidence. Or you know, I've had these kind of, I mean, we could really get going here, but I've had like <laughs> you know, what what I think is can only be explained by you know, the mystical and, you know, maybe spiritual. I'm not really sure. Um, like but I'm what? into it. Yeah, you got, like got what? any examples? Uh, like I've had what I thought might be, okay, all right, let's go there. Uh, so <laughs> after... <laughs> it's a safe space. Welcome to It's All True. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I hope this is true. But when, um, when after my mum died, I had a few experiences that couldn't really be explained, you know, by science or, you know, in any other way that made sense except for me to think maybe this is something else. So I one time was in bed and, you know, for anyone that's lost somebody, you know, night time's the hardest time with grief because in the day you can be really busy, keep yourself occupied and, of course, you're feeling it and it's awful, but once you get to sleep time, nothing else is going on, it's silent and you can really get distressed at that time. And I remember um, trying to sleep and I was crying and crying and my boyfriend at the time was, you know, saying put on the TV or like do something and trying to help me distract myself. Anyway, I eventually fell asleep and I started having this sort of, I had this sensation that my mum was sitting on the edge of the bed and sort of stroking my forehead you know the way that you do with your little kids? Yeah. Um, and that she used to do when I was little. And I just felt this warm breeze come over me. And I, I didn't want to – I felt like I was awake but asleep. I didn't want to open my eyes because I didn't want it to go away. And I just felt totally calm and reassured and, and incredible. And when I opened my eyes – our balcony doors were wide open. Now, we lived uh, on the first floor of a small apartment block and the balcony doors went onto a false balcony. Mm-hmm. There's no, There was nowhere to step outside. It was just looked like a balcony. And the locks required a key and also a bolt that oh. went across the top. Wow. So there was nobody else. My boyfriend was asleep next to me. There was no way a person could get in from the outside. No one had been inside the apartment, but both those locks were undone. The balcony doors were wide open. This is unbelievable. And do you believe that that was 
your mother coming just to let you know that she was okay, but more importantly, just to put you at peace, put you at ease? I mean, I, it's the only thing I can sort of come to. I mean, I, was, I had been so distressed. I was crying and crying and just beside myself. And I, it was one of those really, really bad nights. And then all of a sudden I had this weird experience and there was no way to explain it. Wow. That is so yeah. cool. <laughs> And I, yeah. I've got tears streaming yeah, down my face. She has his gone. Lost it. <laughs> you know why? Because I'm, because I guess I'm a mum, so I can kind of picture, you know, doing that to your child. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know when my my grandmother. Now she, when she lost her husband, two things had happened. She lost her husband, and, and she lost a son. When she lost her husband. The family, my mum was only a little girl. There were only, there was three siblings and he'd only not long passed. And they were, had a photo. They just got out of the bath. They had a photo in the lounge room and they'd all together, just wrapped in towels. They had a little photo. They got the photo developed and they look back and their dad is in the TV screen. Like, oh my God. We still have the photo. And it, wow. he's, you know, he obviously was never on television, but yeah. there he was in the background <laughs> of the photo. And not only that, wow. like when she lost her son, she was very distressed as well. And he went, you know, at a young age. Um, and then he came to her in the night and just said, look, I'm okay. You don't need to worry about me. And he, she mm-hmm. said he just calmly walked in. It was clearly him. And then he left and she felt, you know, she was at ease. She was she was happy again. So he'd like he'd come from the other side to just yeah. calm his mum down to say, you don't, you don't need to worry anymore. Uh. See, I've got full body chills. I've yeah. got, you know, I, 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 that has to be real. That has to be. It does. I don't know. It yeah. does. And, and, you know, I really believe that for whatever reason we were supposed to talk to you today. Um, yeah. Your book, you know, coming off the, the bookshelf was, um, was a very big sign. Um, is it a new book? Embracing Change is what it's called. Is it, is it, is it new? Has it been out there long? Uh, yeah, it came out on the 25th of January this year. Oh, right. So right, it's right. only been out a few months, yeah. Um, um, sorry, George has got a question. Yana, it's it's George here. I've just got a, a bit of a selfish question, really. As, as a younger bloke, I've been in uh, three different states for work over the past year and a half and uh gee whiz a lot of change happening there how, mm. how do i how do i embrace change brand new friends brand new work life uh no family nearby what's the what's the tips there when it comes to kind of moving around for work that's such a hard one because you know our connections to people are the most important thing in our life and to be uprooted all the time and you know to have such big changes like that in such a short period of time I think is going to rock anyone's world and it's going to be hard. But I think as long as you stay connected to the people that you love, as much as it's not the same as in person, you know, keeping in touch on the phone and on FaceTime and staying involved with the lives of the people you've left behind in your other states, I think is a really important thing to do because it's not only helpful to you, when you're kind of starting again and feeling that isolation, that loneliness that comes when you're kind of in a new place for the first time. But it's really important to um, help the whole family or all of your friends as well to feel like you're still part of it and you're part of their lives and you're there for the important things and you're checking in for people's birthdays and, and staying connected. But I think the other thing to do is to think about the reasons why you've been moving and Try to focus on the positives. So if you're moving because you've been getting, you know, incredible roles, I know there's some music theatre in you that um, is very (laughs) exciting. And so, you know, these are amazing things and and kind of once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. So as long as you can keep reminding yourself of the positives and looking at the glass half full, I think that helps a lot as well. Because if you focus on how much you're missing everyone and how lonely you feel, suddenly that becomes your entire experience and it can be easy to overlook the positive. That's really helpful. You're a psychologist. Are you a psychic as well? How did you know about the musical theatre? 
I've been listening, George. Oh, George, he's been listening. Uh oh. Oh, God. Yeah, about his his sexual proclivities. No, we don't need to go in there. I've got a question that I want to ask. Yeah, you go. Um, yeah, now dealing with grief, you must have a lot of uh, pe- you know people who have, have asked you for advice on dealing with grief. And I know in your book you say it's different for everyone. Um, there's no such thing as closure, is there? Yeah, that's something that I really strongly believe in. Um, I think you know we're sort of sold this idea that we'll reach the end of that grief chapter at some point. You know, and as much as that sounds really melancholy to imagine that we never get over our grief, it's it's really true. We don't ever get over it. We just sort of evolve with it and we learn to live with it. So it's really an unfair expectation that we or society puts on us to expect that at a certain point in time, we're actually just going to be okay. And okay, if I just like bide my time and get to like the one year anniversary, then it's going to be the end of this horrible time for me and I'm going to go back to feeling normal again. But I think the thing to acknowledge is that once you've experienced loss, you're not the same person anymore. So you're not going to go back to who you used to be. You're going to be a different version of yourself. And some of that is really painful and really difficult and Nobody wants to accept that. Nobody wants to go through grief and to lose somebody or a relationship or, you know, something like that. Um, But there are really good things that can come out of it too. You know, we do end up stronger. We become more resilient. We learn things about ourselves and we end up in a different place in our life and we see the world in a different way. So as much as I don't want to say grief is a good thing, um, it can add value to our life going through these tough experiences. But I think if we're focusing on closure and imagining that there's a certain place where that loop is going to close, then if we don't achieve that, we can then just become even more distressed. Mm. And I don't think, you know, we don't want to put ourselves through that. We're already going through the worst experience a person can go through. So having that unfair expectation or unrealistic expectation can just make things harder. So I think we need to get rid of that and forget about closure and just think about, well, how am I going to get through today? Mm. Uh, Today is what I need to focus on. And if I made it through today, amazing. Or if I had a terrible day, that's all right because I've got tomorrow to try again. Um, So being being comfortable in the fact that you are now different than you were before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, And I think it takes, perspective and it takes time it's definitely not something that we can just sort of say to ourselves oh you know be okay now or you know accept it you've just got to accept it like because we what, don't want to accept it that's kind of what society you know really says to us doesn't it? you know mm. you've, you've had somebody close to you that passes away and then you have yeah. the funeral um and then you're expected just to go back to normal life um yeah Yeah, that's often the hardest time is after the funeral because in the lead up to that, you know, everyone's busy, everyone's organising things and and they've got tasks to focus on. Everybody's checking in on each other. Everyone's dealing with the loss together. And then you sort of have the funeral and everyone goes back to their real lives again. And that's when you can really feel alone with the loss Mm -hmm. and, you know, when, I don't know, Shezzy, what it's like for you, but for example, when you've lost a friend, you know, there's, there can be a bit of pressure in the friend group. You know, that one's doing much better than me. Why am I still struggling? Um, and I think we compare ourselves to other people all the time anyway, just naturally. It's just a human thing that we do. Um, but it's really important in your grief to, ma- to remember that it is your own race that you're running. And we're all going to feel it differently. We all bring different things to the table. So, you know, I know a bit about your life, Shezzy. I know you've been through so much in your life. And all of that comes with you when you're going through grief. So you've already got all of that stuff in the background. And that can, those can be triggers or they can be things that help you. Um, 
so, you know, when we say grief is unique, it's not just because we're all unique, but it is because we all have our unique experiences and we bring different things to the table, different levels of resilience, different, you know, challenges that we might be dealing with. So the important thing is just to be kind to yourself and know that you're going to have terrible days. That's a given. You're 100% going to have bad days. And you're also going to have moments that are a little bit more endurable. And, you know, you just have to chalk up each little good moment to a win and be kind to yourself and say, you know what, like I was okay today. And that's that's good enough. Death is so – it's it's – the human body is an incredible organism, right? It is mm. massively resilient. It is super strong. It's evolved over millions of years to be this incredible, adaptable, survivable. We can live in cold temperatures, hot temperatures. You, everything about the human system has evolved to be an absolute perfect machine, right? Yeah. Why has evolution yeah not manage to take out the pain of death, considering that death happens to every single person and we all lose them, (laughs) yet still it brings us to our absolute knees. I I, I don't understand why evolution hasn't maybe removed – it's because it's so painful. Why hasn't that been bred out of us? I can't believe we still feel so much. (laughs) I I hear you on that, you know, and I think to some degree our brains – try to do that, you know, where there's lots of kind of protection mechanisms that can kick in when we're going through really tough things. And some people try to avoid their feelings and bury them and can be really good at it for a while. And there are other things they might do. They might mask it. They might take up things that they shouldn't. Um, You know, I think we're all guilty of trying to drink away our troubles occasionally and, you know, thinking that that's a totally socially appropriate response. Um, so I think there are things that we do to try and avoid some of that because you're right, it's so hideous and there's no escaping it. But what Kate Langbrook said to me when I was talking with her about grief uh, on my podcast, and this really stayed with me, is that grief is really just the other side of love. And if we're feeling grief, it just means that we've really loved mm-hmm. and I think that's kind of a nice way to look at it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that is lovely. That is lovely. Mm. That, that is, is lovely. It feels like there must be a reason, you know, and maybe it's to further a deep appreciation of those that you've lost and and, and you and then you mm. sort of you relive your experiences with that person and they live on longer in your memory or their spirit mm. remains around us longer because it because we hurt so for so long, yeah. But it feels like it's there has to be a reason why we hurt so so much, considering that death mm-hmm. is absolutely everywhere and it's unavoidable. Mm. Yeah, I think I think that's the scary thing. It it is going to happen to every single person we know. It's going to happen to us. And um, you know, for someone that's so comfortable talking about grief and death, I have to say, like, I'm terrified of dying myself. And Part of that is, I think, the fear of the unknown. I don't know what it's going to feel like. Is it going to hurt? Is it going to be scary? Um, Going before your time, I think, you know, anyone that's lost someone early, like like I did losing my mum at 21, you know, it sort of left me with this um, anxiety about me dying suddenly. And now I've got three little ones myself and, you know, the, the... fear I have of them going through what I went through is real and immense and you know if I knew for certain that okay well if it does happen I can visit them in the night and stroke them on the head or (laughs) or appear to them and you know like if I could guarantee that then maybe I wouldn't be so anxious about it but Think about all the cool because, things you could do. You could unlock any yeah. door you want anywhere in the world. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, that would be amazing. But I did try to make a deal with my grandma about that, you know, when she was getting close to her final days. We would we would always say, you know, or in the last year I would say, promise me, let's see what can happen. Like try and come to me yeah. when you do go. Um, but she never did. I never got... Unless I missed the signs, you know, I never had a big moment like my, I did with my mum 
um, with her. So then it sort of puts me back, well, is it real? And, yeah, true. And, you know, yeah. what does happen? Well, it's it's funny you say, say that because my mum cut a deal with her partner, right? So he, we lost him, uh-huh. how many years ago? Three or four or four years ago. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and she said to him, all right, if the other side exists, prove to me. She goes, I want to see... She, I want to see something um, mm. you know, with Patrick Swayze. Oh, yeah, it's Patrick Swayze. Like, do <laughs> do it via Patrick Swayze, yeah. and then I'll know it's then I'll know it's something you because that was I've like never seen before. that was their joke between each other. That she obviously really loved Patrick Swayze. So, and then yeah. what happened? This only happened not that long ago. Yeah. So on her phone popped up a, a dirty dancing video with Patrick Swayze that she'd never seen before. And like my mum does not oh use her phone God. for anything other than making a phone call or text. Like she's not tech savvy. So this video just out of nowhere that she doesn't even have on her phone yeah. started playing and it's patrick swayze mm. oh my god i've got goosebumps again yeah and it's, that is amazing it was so crazy because we spoke to um australia's cowgirl medium uh, a few episodes yeah. back and she gave us a message for uh grant's mum's from grant's mum's partner and one of the messages was that he keeps putting this painting um like on its side. That's right. My oh mum's really, God. really She's anal really with her house. Like hideous. everything is just absolutely OCD perfection, right? But this one yeah. one painting has just been, she'd come in the room and it's suddenly on its side it's on crooked. the wall. And it's like, re- oh my like God. every day. It was pissing her off and she was accusing her <laughs> flatmate of doing it, her best friend. And then, uh, yeah, the medium said, no, that's, that's, that's your partner. That's the trick that he's playing on wow. you. Wow. And, yeah, that's exactly wow. what he used to, used to do when he was alive. And so that was the reason why she said, well, if this is real, send me, you know, a sign. So, yeah, yeah there has oh, to be something out there. I mean, I, that's amazing. You know, I believe in it. Um, we should move on because I also mm-hmm. wanted to talk about imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. We have somebody. George. <laughs> We have somebody he's a sex god. who I think. <laughs> I know I am. What are you talking about? Um, Grant, I'm looking at you. Yes. You have spoken about having imposter. Can yeah. you just, in a nutshell, Yana, tell us what imposter syndrome is? What it really is, is the fancy new name for self doubt, you know? And I think we, it's always been there. Self doubt has always been there. And I think anybody who is, reasonable and reflective uh, can have a little portion of imposter syndrome. I mean, it's obviously if there's a scale, there's some people that are completely debilitated by imposter syndrome and it stops them from even doing anything and trying anything because they think, well, who would want to listen to me? What have I got to say? What have I got to share? Why me? There's Mm -hmm. no reason I should be doing that. Um, Down to, you know, just little healthy nudges along the way saying, mm, you know, come down a peg or two, mate. You know, you're not that good. Yeah. Um, and everything in between. And I think for so many of us, in, in myself included, imposter syndrome is just that nagging voice that's always there. And anytime we do something, it is that sort of little elbow in the ribs, like, really? Why you? Yeah. Why you? Yeah, I'm gu- um, gu- totally guilty. You know, no matter right. what I've managed to achieve in my career, I still and the entire journey through was, I'm not good enough for this. I can't mm. do this. I'm not smart enough for this. I'm not the best at this. Yet I I'm s- going to be found out. I'm going to be found out. Yeah. I realise that, I'm a, that I'm a fraud and a fake. But somehow, yep. it's also driven me, and and it's it's painful. It's annoying as hell, and it's mm. hard to push through because it consumes so much of your of your energy and there's so much yeah. negative self-talk that goes along with that however yeah. I do think that there is an element of that that it's that's made me push so damn hard to be better than everyone else to prove to my own self-talk that it may be mm-hmm. I, I do deserve it you know what I mean I think it's also worked yeah. to push me to another level as hard as that has been yeah well you you're a competitive guy right you're competing against yourself Yes. Yeah. So it's like, well, you know what? I am going to show you. I am going to do really well. I am going to do this. Um, and I think Does that I mean think you that's... guys split personality. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Look, we all talk to ourselves. We all have that inner critic and that little voice in there. And sometimes the volume gets really, really loud, and you can't ignore it. And other times, 
it's a bit more easy to turn it off. And, you know, I think the fact that you're able to use that grant to um, motivate yourself and to do better and to achieve everything that you're after um, is fantastic. And that's where you want to be, you know. So if you can acknowledge that that voice is there and that there's that part of yourself that's always kind of um, feeling like an imposter, and, mm. and that's where the name comes from. It's, you know, feeling like a fraud, like you're going to be found out to be not as good as you're portraying uh, to everybody. Um then, you know, that that's a really, really positive thing that you're using it in that way. And I think if you Google it, you'll see, you know, almost every successful person that that is out there has, well, not everyone, but a lot of people talk about it. And I think probably if everybody is honest, everybody would say they experience it to mm. some degree. I think I'd enjoy my career and would have enjoyed my career a lot more if I had less of it because... And it gets mm-hmm. worse. The more you achieve, the worse it gets. Yeah. Don't you feel? Yeah, you feel like you've got more to lose the yeah. further up the ladder you climb. And, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, and it's quite a torturous this... condition. It's, yeah, it's, it's taken a lot of the fun out of things that should have been amazing mm-hmm. for me, I reckon. And it's a real lesson in learning to be vulnerable for you. Yeah. George is nodding well, a lot. George, do you, do you relate to any of this? I do. Like only recently today, I was having a chat with with my my boss, Yana, and we were talking about how far I've progressed in my radio career. We we listened to the first talk break I did around this time last year. Never been a work day jock, always a serious uh, journalist. But I I, I walked away uh, just kind of feeling, I don't know, a little bit off, like, oh, wow. Like how on earth did I get to be a part of this dream job when like, I've listened to this break and I'm like, oh, it just didn't sound incredible. How on earth did they hire me? Like why on earth would you have wanted me? And that was the first break I ever produced for you guys. And then you listen to me now. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm 10 million times better. But th- this, this afternoon, this imposter syndrome, this perfectionist side of me has just been coming out. Mm. So uh, totally uh, mm. nodding along. And, and does imposter syndrome and perfectionism kind of go hand in hand? They can, absolutely, you know, and, and just as I was listening to your story just then, I was thinking, well, you know, I guess imposter syndrome doesn't always necessarily mean, you know, you like you say, you were, you're way better now and you feel way more confident now, but when you listen back and, and you think, oh, I wasn't actually that good then, you know, it, that, it can come and, and bite you even, you know, after the fact when you haven't necessarily lived that in your first experience, maybe when you first did that first break and you thought you were really good and you were full of adrenaline and feeling I thought I was hot like shit you... then and I listened back to it <laughs> and I'm like, why would they have hired me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, you know, obviously you're better than you think and and you're just being too hard on yourself and um, that perfectionism is, is another little kind of niggly self-doubt thing that can creep in and, you know, as long as it doesn't get in the way, you know, being reflective and critiquing yourself um, to a degree is, is a good thing. You know, you want to be thinking about what you're doing and looking back and figuring out ways to do things better. Um, so don't be too hard on yourself where it stops you from doing anything and stops you from going for the next job. But, you know, use it to empower yourself and to motivate yourself to do the little changes that maybe you do need to do as you have done. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, it's um, it sounds like it can all, it can propel you to be the best, but it could also push you close to madness if, if it goes unchecked. Absolutely. Have you got any yeah. sort of tips on how, how we can sort of pull back that sort of negative self talk, how we can maybe reduce the limitations of perfectionism a little bit? Well, I think um, when you're talking about things like imposter syndrome or perfectionism, it's really important to acknowledge it, you know, and that can take a little while and that can be hard to do because you've got to hold up that mirror to yourself and and think, you know, okay, how am I doing? What do I really think of myself? Well, what is that self-talk like you were talking about, Grant? You know, we all have that dialogue inside and sometimes when it's really negative, that can be really confronting. And you, you might have to dig a little bit deeper and figure out, well, what's going on? Why am I why am I so hard on myself? You know, is there something I need to be working on to kind of address 
some of those feelings and those thoughts or those experiences that you might have had that might have been negative and have led you down this path of of self-criticism. But acknowledging it is one thing and uh, the other thing is actively trying to talk yourself out of it. So with imposter syndrome, for example, and this is probably something you're already doing, Grant, but um, saying to yourself, yeah, okay, I hear you, but I'm doing it anyway, Mm. you know, and not letting that voice of the, you know, inner critic get so loud that you can't actually hear your own voice anymore. So you want to be saying things like countering it with positivity. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know why anyone would want me. There's surely 10,000 other people that would be better for this than me. But there are all these professionals that have hired me for this. You know, there are people who are experts in their field that think I'm right for this. Yeah. So I'm going to go with it. And I might feel like I'm a fraud, but I'm going to go with it because they're experts and I'm going to trust them. That's a really They've good given tip. me this job. Mm. So question uh, yeah. your thoughts and feelings. Yeah, know that you aren't you aren't your thoughts. Your thoughts are independent yeah. of who you are. And even if you're in a time when your thoughts aren't great, know that I am not the sum of my thoughts. Absolutely, yeah. And they're powerful, are, are these little brains of ours. They come up with everything. They want to trip us up, especially if you're in that negative sort of spiral, you know, which is so easy for us all to get into at different times in our lives. And if we let that become the powerful or the overriding voice in our head, then, you know, it can be really hard to overcome. So, you know, sometimes you do have to defer to the outside and collect evidence from other people around you. Well, you know, I am loved and I am appreciated and I am, you know, doing well in my career or whatever it is that you're chasing and, you know, use that evidence to counter that negative little dialogue that's going on in the background saying you're not good enough. Can I just blame my mum and my dad? That sounds like it's a fair bit easier than actually doing any real work myself. I'm going to say it's their fault. They screwed me up. I'm broken because of them. Oh, do you think um, – Absolutely. Do you think, what about anxiety? How does that play into <clears throat> imposter syndrome a bit? Oh, we've lost Grant. Uh, I think it uh, – yeah, look, I think it's, um, it does have – uh, a lot to do with it, um, you know, and I think, you know, there's there's sort of healthy anxiety and then there's debilitating anxiety and I've certainly experienced both in my life and um, I know that sometimes anxiety can be a really helpful thing and propel you along in the, in the right direction and, and make you want to keep going and doing better, um, but other times it can really play into that negative self-talk. And that can be, you know, one of the things that's underlying some of that self-criticism that we might be experiencing. So that's definitely something that we should all kind of look into and say say to ourselves, how much is anxiety playing into this stuff that's going on for me? You know, what is, what is there that might be underlying some of these louder voices in my head? And, pra- and practicing gratitude or meditation what do you, what, what are your yeah, yeah. What, what are the go-tos uh look for me i'm not great with meditation myself i love it for other people but for me it actually makes me a bit anxious to be honest <laughs> right, right <laughs> is that the, the idea of having to sit still and, and you know dedicating say 10 minutes to doing nothing yeah. because you're a busy working mum <laughs> It could be that, yeah. I mean, there's always something to, to, to do, right? Yeah. But for me, I, I think I, I meditate, I guess, in different ways, like going for a walk or doing Pilates, for example. So I guess in a way, your head is clearing out and you're focusing on your body and your breathing in a different way. So just a um, walk, even and, just a walk could be an absolute yeah. game changer for someone with anxiety then. Mm. Totally, totally, yeah. And I think activity, moving your body is – a huge, uh, you know, panacea, not to use a, a silly word like that, but, you know, it's it's medicinal. It makes you feel, it's like a natural antidepressant just to get some exercise. You don't need to be going to boxing classes or going for a run, although all of that stuff's really good for you. Um, even just a walk uh, to get a change of scenery and get your body moving is, you know, definitely where you want to start. And then finding time to do the things that make you feel good as well and you know even for 
even understanding whether you're an introvert oh, or an extrovert. We've lost Grant. He's laughing looking at George now. Cause <laughs> oh, George, he... things that make you feel good, mate. Does oh, that, does God, that help <laughs> us. Sorry, yeah. Do you want to list them, on right one, list them on one hand? Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, hey, God, Yana, let's, let's... I'm just going to turn let's their get, microphones off. Shes, shes. Yana, <laughs> let's, let's get reels for just a second. No one knows anxiety like uh, George knows anxiety. His mum came up to visit him recently and he had a bunch of sex toys hiding in a cupboard and he believes his mum found them. So that's oh, whoa. No. What should he do with his mum? Should he? Because she she came home and he looked in the eye and she had a weird look. Should he broach it with her or should he just let it go? Oh, well, I guess you know that's a hard one. I think you have to it think is hard, about. Yes. <laughs> or it was perhaps. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you have to you have to think about what's it going to do to her to have that conversation. You might feel better putting it out there and getting it off your chest, but is it going to mortify her and make her feel, you know, freaked out, or is she going to be able to see the funny side of it and you could have a laugh about it together and and actually you'll both feel a bit better having. Yeah. You know, Grant forgot to mention it. that I picked up these toys from a pinata at a theatre party. Oh. So, <laughs> personally, <laughs> unnecessary no. detail. Oh. Unnecessary. No, no judgment here. I think it's a pretty big detail. <laughs> 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 he was really he did it he was he came in to do the podcast he's like guys i don't know what to do I, uh, he's obviously his mum is a lovely lovely lady who we know we know very well and george is very sweet and grant takes the oh, my phone keeps buzzing grant takes the mickey out of him all the time trying to make him embarrassed should i just come oh, clean no. should i just come clean you know what? Given that it was from a piñata, I would come clean. Have yeah. a laugh about it. Great call. Yeah. Great call. Perfect. Yeah. I'll text her right now. Thank you. <laughs> this is a very healing session for our young, young George. Oh, I'm so glad I could help. <laughs> oh, um, Yana, give yourself a bit of a plug. So where can people find your book, Embracing Change? I'm going to hold it up for our YouTube. Oh, that's right. We're on television. Yes. Yeah, so stop. Oh, thank thank stop you for sharing that. Um, yeah, look, you can get Embracing Change everywhere. It's in all the bookstores. It's in Kmart. It's in Big W. You can order it online at Booktopia. Um, if you wanted to, if you prefer listening to books instead of reading them, it's available on Audible. And I am the narrator on that one. So if you like the sound of these dulcet tones, <laughs> please go ahead and, <laughs> and order it. Um, um, but otherwise, you yeah. Well, as we Sorry, found out, uh, you don't need to find the book. The book finds you. Oh, yeah. It just, that is jump, true. It just yeah. jumps off the shelf <laughs> as you walk past. Um, Absolutely. And people can also find you on the Curious Life podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So that's um, available on all the podcasting apps and you can find me on Instagram. I'm starting to get a bit better at social media. It's been something I haven't um, put a lot of time into but it's really instagram's the place where i'm kind of sharing all the latest updates there so find me at the curious life podcast and um let me know what you think of the book thank you yana firestone uh which is also a magnificent name oh, yeah. i might add if that fe- is your real name oh, that thanks. is a whole that is my name. real name that is <laughs> you sound like a marvel character like it is it's, it's a superhero it's a i great love name. that well, you know, we actually, I, I sort of went with the patriarchal system of giving my first two kids my partner's name, which is a bit of a complicated Dutch surname. It's hard to pronounce. And with the third one, I, I was kind of saying, well, what do we do? I really want to give them Firestone. Can't we change them all? And, and I think he might be coming around because yeah. we've named the third one Firestone. And so the idea now is to backtrack and change the others, but I'm not sure we've fully got him over the line yet. Whoa. So if we can get the... Grant and Shazzy Denya seal of approval. I might just get him over Hell the line. Yes. Absolutely. Rip a name. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Rip a name. I know what your superpower would be if you were a Marvel character. You'd be able to like unlock balcony doors in the middle of the night. <laughs> With your brain. With your brain. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it. I just haven't harnessed my own power yet. <laughs> that's the next book that's going to come Love flying it. off the bookshelf, slap me in the face. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> thank, oh. thank you, Yana. It's been so wonderful to chat. We really appreciate so it. Oh, Cheers, Yana. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Really appreciate it.
Thanks, Yana. We'll, right. we'll talk to Thank you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Sounds good. Bye. That was pretty cool. That was amazing. I yeah. had so That's many like questions. That's like a free session ask. right there. I'll transfer was... the funds over. No. <laughs> but I reckon, mate, like considering with COVID, the fact that people are just struggling to pay their bills, just the, the weight of we've had fires, we've had floods, we've got wars in, in the Ukraine. We have just, we all, everyone's anxiety is just through the roof. We all feel like there is just something heavy weighing on us right now. And I think no matter what situation you're going through, maybe you've lost someone or maybe you're having a tough time at work or maybe you don't believe in yourself. Mm. I think there's something in what she was saying for absolutely everyone, which absolutely. is why it's good to, you know, to have, have her on. She was fantastic. Yeah, really, really, really good tips. So, and I like it that she's been through a lot of it herself as well. I think that, I don't know, sometimes you talk to therapists or to authors who write about other people's experiences and they haven't actually lived it themselves. And that's, mm. that's one thing I found, uh, you know, I struggle reading books. Like, and I confessed that to her yesterday when I spoke before organising the pod, uh, before organising her to come on today. I was like, I have ADHD and I struggle to sit down and read a book. Mm. However, the way this book is written is really easy. Mm. She writes the same way that she speaks. Oh, that's good. That makes it easier. Yeah. Because yeah. if they get too academic y, that's right. I, I just can't compute. No, and she's definitely not that. So, yeah, I'm embracing change. Yeah, that's uh, great. That was really, that was really good fun. Really good fun. As a, here's a funny, funny thing, that little thought that came to me when she was talking about changing the kids' names back to her names. I was like, well, what's the husband going to think? I mean, if you imagine you came, back to, came to me and said, well, okay, uh, Sunday and Scout and Sailor are now going to be Rogers instead of Denya, I'd be like, oh, there goes the marriage. <laughs> it's the first sign. <laughs> it all ends today, kids. <laughs> Mum doesn't love Dad anymore. Oh, but I think times are changing. That's the first now. thing I thought of. I would look. It doesn't worry me. Like if you wanted to name our kids, okay, um, yeah, well, yeah uh, we'll Rogers. I was like, yeah, cool. Like I didn't care if you were going to take no, Dan, Daniel or not. I was joking. But yeah, if you're going to change the names back, I'd it's be hard. Like, when your kids are a little I bit really older. should have taken those bins out last night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a list. There's a list of things that you haven't done. No, it's really good. It was yeah, really, really good. Mate, um, don't sweat about. Uh, listening back to one of your breaks, I still do it and I still do it to stuff that was on television last week, let alone last year, let alone 10 years ago, let alone the first thing I ever did. It's, uh, it, it'll, it'll always be like that. Um, but, but you're it's always a horrendous you're, feeling. Yeah. You're tougher on yourself than what other people are. And I say that to someone <coughs> yeah. sitting next to me all the time. But don't forget that little bit of that, that, that there's a bit in you that is annoyed that you sounded terrible is the bit that will propel you to be absolutely amazing. So don't dwell on it. Know that that little driving factor is what will make you great, mate. So don't let it burn you up. And it was a year ago. Definitely. That's it. To give you an idea, I sounded like. <laughs> yeah, give us, give us a demo. Give oh, us a yeah, demo. can you play it? I don't have it on me, but to give you an idea, I said I must, I must have been nervous because I'm pretty good behind the mic, but I sounded like, like John Laws trying to do a top forty music <laughs> uh, music show. <laughs> like it was, it was low, it was yeah. grovelly, it was, it was not oh, right. Got... But... So what were you doing? Here's another one from Smash Mouth. Traffic and weather coming up next. What were, what were, <laughs> yeah. what were you doing? Real low frequencies. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> like uh, Nelly, Nelly Furtado on this station, and coming up next, it's Beyonce, single ladies. Uh, look, I can't even do it, but it was. I was saying all of these really like upbeat new artists, whatever, and I sounded like a a, a ninety year old man. It wasn't <laughs> like... reading the funeral notices on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember your first Mate, like, my, sessions it's... in the voiceover booth? Freaking terrible. I yeah. sound like an eight year old girl. I, and then tonight on the news, <laughs> yeah, and then a car crashed into the service station. And, and then tonight the mayor, the mayor said, This is the best town in Australia. Hooray. What you didn't put on it, but mine was like so, so overdone. Bad. Oh, like, you, yeah, you would have been like full. So overdone. Like real deep. I can't even think now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you would have. Tonight. 
tonight on Prime News. Yeah, you would have gone full like young. The low whisper. Yeah. Because yeah. people, there was. Cheryl Rogers, Prime Local News. Because there was a theory that the more you dropped your octave, the more important you sounded. Yeah. And that's what we thought when you're doing it, but you listen back to it and you go, it is so. But not people real. still do it. Yeah, but they do. They do. There's a lot of journos that still Here do. Here at first tonight and it's at a, five. I reckon and it's I, a crime. But this is, goes back to that for, that bloke who first gave me a start in television, Doug Hogan. Yeah. This is the one thing. The one thing he told me, and it was pretty much the main thing. And he said, just talk like you talk to your mates at the pub. He said, that's hard to do. G'day, mate. But when you <laughs> – G'day, dig it. How's it hanging? <laughs> <laughs> but when you do it – the audience hears it. Hears it. Mm. Hears it clearer. They hear it in their own language rather than try to do this too much. What about? Uh, I don't think we've ever said this before, but what about um, sunrise weather? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I was the weatherman, I would throw to the weather, and where there was this little sort of five second sting that would play before the weather map would come up. And do it properly. and the voiceover would go like, "I go, let's take a look at today's forecasts, sunrise weather," and then the map would play right, and that was Shezzy's <laughs> voice. <laughs> oh, was that you, Shezzy? Yeah, yeah, it was. She actually recorded For years, it, but it sounded really. I can't do it now because I've got yeah, a blocked good. note. That was really good. Right. That was great. Sunrise and I'd get weather. all these horny little fourteen-year-old boys <laughs> would come up to me everywhere I go, going, "Oh, if you got the girl who says sunrise weather with you." Like, who's, who says sunrise weather? <laughs> like, all these little naughty little horny kids just like, oh, oh that voice was so sexy and it was so, so <laughs> funny. And then I go, there she is over there. <laughs> eating, did it throw you off during the pie. broadcast, Grant? Oh, no. I think that's possibly – maybe that's why I fell in love with you. Maybe you subconsciously penetrated my brain and my heart by doing so. that voiceover every half an hour for eight I years of my it. life. Just chipped away at me bit by bit. Sunrise weather. It was one syllable oh, People time. used to it take so them. breathy, so like, breathy. When Grant used to, when we used to be on the road, and Grant would say, "Okay, well, let's take a look at the weather," and then like the whole crowd would go, "Sunrise weather," and I used to say, "Don't <laughs> tell anyone that is me." George, I won't lie; it's actually doing something for me right now. Oh um, my god! I can tell. Maybe move the camera up so I can't see. Oh my Whoa, god! Whoa! Time no, to make stop. another baby. Oh god! Yeah. Oh, no. What? No? No. Season four, child four. Oh, God, you've already given me a cold. <laughs> I don't need anything else can you from catch you. Colds, can you catch colds through Zoom? Because I've got a cold too. Oh, I think we've you? all got it now. Oh. We know how you get you contract your stuff, yeah, mate. Yeah, horse lips. Horse lips on a penis, <laughs> yeah. Just go to a drama party and you get every single infection and sickness <laughs> and sex toy you want. Oh, it's my God. Well, it's not a party. It's just a human Petri dish. That's what you guys are, a science experiment. <laughs> um. So... <laughs> Coming up in a few episodes, George, can we speak to your mum? Oh, and can we speak to your great best friend um, or somebody who knows yep. you, you know, pretty well? You can speak to my mum, but my best friend, as Grant knows, she doesn't speak. Mm-hmm. Who's that? What if I'm going to work on her? I'm going, to, I'm going to try and get her on because look, we've we've laughed and joked a lot on this podcast, and there are things Who's that have been friend? said. Cherie, oh, the blow up doll. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, don't tell me. No, that. I can. Grand make... So like a similar deal to what we did with yeah, yeah. Be fun. Yeah, oh, I, think be I think we should have this this situation out with your mum. The, the whole oh sex my toys thing. Let's not do it. Let's do it in the podcast, okay? No, and I promise we won't. I won't. I, I look. I, I don't want to ruin your relationship with you and your mum, and I promise I won't go over the top or, or you know, or poke the bear or, or be too gross, but I think it would be lovely if you brought this up on our podcast. Yeah. There's no other place I really would do it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's my boy. No, I'm getting embarrassed. I'm oh, so proud of you right oh now. My God. Content first. Um, That would be really good. Yeah, I would like Yeah, to. for sure. And maybe we could speak to, um, you know, the, the dental person if that all works oh, out yeah. why not suss it out bro yeah. suss it out good. see if it's going well um <laughs> feel free to record anything that you're that you're doing uh, whether it be at a date or dinner or whatever or ask if she's just happy to come on one of australia's um least known podcasts <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm sure she would be absolutely thrilled to do that. No, I will work on that. I'll get some contacts. We will do a get to know Georgie boy. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, man. There we go. Yeah, that'd be good. Love you, brother. You're going to have a great week, okay? Know that you are destined for great things, my friend. Believe in yourself because I believe in you. Yeah. No. Thank you very, very much. It's the only reason I do this podcast for those lovely compliments. <laughs> well, that and we're continually damaging your relationship with your parents. Oh, my God. <laughs> now we're going to heal it. We're going to build bridges. Wow. We're going to heal it. Love you guys so much. Keep on embracing change, yeah? Yeah. yeah. We do have a therapist on hand, uh, i.e. being Yana, if we need to get her in, you know, to do a bit of a, a debrief with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> Have her on standby. Yes, yes, please do. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll Thank catch you, you next time. Bye. Bye. It's all true. The podcast with Grant and Shezzy Denya. Bye.